السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا وحبيبنا وقدوتنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم قل هل يستوي الذين يعلمون والذين لا يعلمون وقال سبحانه يرفع الله الذين آمنوا منكم والذين أوتوا العلم درجات وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم طلب العلم فريضة على كل مسلم صدق الله العظيم وصدق رسوله النبي الكريم ونحن على ذلك من الشاهدين والشاكرين والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم انفعنا بما علمتنا وعلمنا ما ينفعنا وزدنا علما وعملا وإخلاصا وتوفيقا يا رب العالمين اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه آمين يا رب العالمين الحمد لله all glory praise be to Allah سبحانه وتعالى our creator and may salutations and blessings be upon our prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم who was sent as mercy to mankind and may blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon his companions and upon his followers till the day of judgment and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us amongst them we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us beneficial knowledge and to the, give us the ability to act upon that knowledge with sincerity and increase our knowledge we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to see the haqq and the ability to follow the haqq and allow us to see the batil and the ability to abstain or avoid that batil. Ameen Ya Rabbil Alameen. As my teachers would advise me, and this is the way I start all my lectures and every series that is supposed to be started, intention. We are sitting here today. We don't want our time to go to waste. We don't want our efforts to go to waste. We want to make sure that we maximize our time that we are here today. We maximize and take the most benefit out of our sitting and our gathering today. And that can be done initially with our intentions. You know, subhanAllah, some people came, right, had other commitments, but are sitting in the gatherings of knowledge. Expect Allah that He would reward you in the most magnificent and in the most bountiful way possible. These are the expectations a person should have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, I may not be able to go the length of an hour, but this is where intentions come in. You guys came, in, came here for an hour to listen to the talks or to the words of Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So even though we may not be able to continue our full length today, ask Allah to reward you for the full time. This is how intentions work. It is so beautiful. This is how the reward system works with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I really did not want to miss out on this topic and on this series. Simply because, as I said, it is very near to me. It is very dear to me. It is very important to me. Because we are going to be talking about our Islamic scholarship, how it developed in the early phases. And today we sit here 1400 years later and with audacity and with conviction we can say that you know subhanallah the process through which we got the sayings of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the process through which we got the tafsir of the Quran and the fiqh and everything related to Islamic studies, it is a beautiful process. It is a beautiful process. One of my teachers mentioning, and I'm forgetting the name of one of the Salafs quoting him, he said, even our books of history, even our books of tarikh, they can stand more scrutiny and criticism than other books written in that field. Simply because of how with honor and delicacy this knowledge passed on from generation to generation to generation. And it got to us. It got to us. And Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah said something really amazing about knowledge. He said there's a leather in knowledge 
There is a special taste and knowledge. For me, Sahara, Sahari لتنقيح العلوم ألذ لي من. It is more delightful for me to spend my nights in acquiring knowledge and to study and to flip through the pages than to spend it with a beautiful woman. Because there's a taste to knowledge. So how did this get to us? So this series, I'm going to go back to the earliest generation, the first generations, the scholars who were made in that generation, and how they created their students and then their students. So who was that generation? The generation of Sahaba, radiallahu anhum. There are three fields. There are three fields. So today is lecture one. This is a four-part series. Today is lecture one. Next week we will lecture two. And the week after lecture three and lecture four. So there are three fields which I will be covering of Islamic studies. And we'll talk about three scholars which had an impact in those fields. The field of Quran and Tafsir. The field of Hadith and related sciences. And the field of Fiqh. Remember, Fiqh, a lot of times we perceive and we think that we got this from Aymat al Arba. But really, it goes back all the way to the Sahaba. All this really goes back to, and I'm going to discuss in a moment, why Sahaba right now? Why are we discussing and why are we going all the way to there in a second? But first of all, as I said, Tafsir and Quran, Hadith and related sciences. Number three, Fiqh. And fourth session, I'm not going to give any hint except to say that it will be a very special session and it will be completely sur and you will be inshallah completely surprised so today inshallah i want to talk about a sahabi who was truly a scholar who brought value and who basically was a pioneer a founder in the science of tafsir of the quran al kareem Inshallah, before that, what I, meant, what, what I mentioned before was why Sahaba? Why Sahaba though? Because all these sciences go back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the one who trained these Sahaba. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the one who taught these Sahaba. And SubhanAllah, Simply, خَيْرُ النَّاسِ قَرْنِي ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ The best of generation is my generation, and then that follows, and then that follows. The generation of the Sahaba. Our whole purpose of seeking knowledge is what? To please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I remember this very... I remember this incident which one of the shuyukh, he was giving a lesson and he was asked this question. He said, a person said, كيف أكون من حفاظ الحديث? How do I become from the people who have memorized حفاظ الحديث? Like Hafiz ibn Hajar, right? Hafiz Imam al-Nawawi, people who have memorized thousands and thousands of hadith. He said, we do not seek or pursue knowledge so that we, we can become Hufadh al-Hadith. We do not study Fiqh in order to become a Faqih. We do not study Tafsir in order to become a Mufassir. We really, our purpose of seeking knowledge is to get to Allah. Is to recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is at the end of the day to earn the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is our purpose of seeking knowledge. And that is why, you know, with knowledge, a person is rewarded for every step they take towards that process. Whoever takes that journey towards knowledge, Allah facilitates a path for them towards Jannah. 
That is the difference between seeking knowledge for the pleasure of Allah and seeking knowledge for someone else's sake. We are here to seek knowledge to get to Allah. So Sahaba radiallahu anhu being the best of generations, they took knowledge directly from Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they got the most of that knowledge. What was the most of that knowledge? Their connection with Allah. Their connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, a person, they spend their time, they sacrifice their time, years of their life, going over books and books and books. What are they doing it for? You know, a person who's going over the different tafsir. Okay, what does this tafsir say? And what does this tafsir say? What is the purpose of that? So that they can better understand the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At the end of the day, the purpose of that is so that a person can get better acquainted with Allah. A person can get more closer to Allah. So that a person could attain the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the purpose of knowledge. And that generation, they achieved that purpose. They achieved that purpose. And secondly... Even Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his time, in his lifetime, he singled out a few sahaba who had achieved the rank of scholarship or who had, the, who had achieved the rank of a scholar. Sahabis like Ubay ibn Ka'ab, a reciter of the Qur'an, a master reciter of the Qur'an. A person like Zayd ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu who was known as a faqih of Medina, the jurist of Medina, the most knowledgeable when it comes to the matters of inheritance. People used to go to him. He was someone who was appointed with the task to oversee the compilation or the uh, transcribing of the Qur'an by Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Right? These were scholars. So today, inshallah, I want to talk about the scholar who was a pioneer, a founder in the science of tafsir. Anyone wants to guess which Sahabi this is? There we go. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma. Tarjuman al Quran. Someone who has an authority of interpreting the Quran. Really, subhanAllah, this, these halaqas are going to be very simple. We're not going to talk about their entire lives, but very select incidents from their life that will be part one of what made them get to that rank and then how they impacted that science or that field which they mastered in. So inshallah, as I said today, you will have to excuse me. I will just try to finish part one talking about some incidents from the lives of life of Abdullah ibn Abbas and inshallah next week before I continue on Sahabi number two I will take some time to talk about the impact he had on his field which he mastered Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu anhuma he was born some people say uh, uh, Imam al-Zahabi Sirul al-I'lam al-Nubala mentions that he was born three years before Hijrah. Some other Mu'arrikhun have him being born two years prior to Hijrah. Some people say one year prior to Hijrah. So let's say if we were to take three years before Hijrah, how many years he was born three years prior to Prophet wasallam migrating to Medina al-Munawwara. So how many years did he get to spend in the company of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? I have 11, I have 14, 18, 19. Very good. MashaAllah, so you are deducting the age of where he was a child. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away from this world at the beginning of the 11th year of Hijrah. All right, so 10 years, which month did he pass away? Yeah, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Rabi'ul Awwal. Rabi -awwal. He was born in the month of Rabi'ul Awwal. He passed away from this uh, world 
in the month of Rabiul Awwal. So Abdullah ibn Abbas had 10 years of the life in Medina and three years prior to that. That is altogether 13 years or so. That is altogether 13 years and or so. And he narrates almost 1600 ahadith from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Mentioned in, most of them mentioned in Bukhari and Muslim. How old was even Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away? Most of the scholars say he was not even a teenager. Let's say we take the furthest estimate, he was only 13 years old. He narrates 1600 ahadith, most of them narrated in Bukhari and Muslim. So what made this boy get to such a level at such a tender age? First of all, in that culture, there was something known as Sinna Tamiz, Tamiz, an age of slight maturity, where a child is not a child anymore, but they can differentiate if this is hot or this is cold. All right, that is known as in at Tamiz. At that very tender age of six or seven, he started to do mulazama or lazam in Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Become fully attached to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. At that very young tender age, he, he went and followed around the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was with him at every step of the way. You know, sometimes how a child, you know, he's attached to you and he's stuck to you wherever you go. That's what he started doing at the very tender age of six or seven years old. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma. One night, and these are, uh, you know, subhanallah. Let me share the first story here. And there's a very deep lesson in this story. Remember, when we talk about these incidents, we need to drive out lessons because these are just not simply historical facts that we can narrate and move on. This is something that we have to take lessons from. Maymuna Umm al-Mu'minin radiallahu anha was the wife of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She was also the khala, maternal aunt of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma. At the age of six and seven, a young boy he would sneak into the tent of Maymuna, his khala radiallahu anhuma, her hujra, and try to spend a night there. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam one night was with Maymuna radiallahu anha, and Abdullah ibn Abbas was also there. And Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, a good chunk or a good portion of his night would go in, praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, tahajjud. So Prophet وسلم, gets up for tahajjud and this boy Abdullah ibn Abbas, he's lying there pretending to be asleep. Prophet وسلم, starts his prayer, he gets up, this boy, he gets up and stands with the Prophet وسلم, on his left side. Prophet وسلم, grabs him and moves him towards his right side. That is known as lazam or mulazamatun nabiyya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam being fully acquainted or completely attached with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now a very deep lesson for our youth. And today, you know, subhanallah, as I said, 13 year old boy, 13 year old person narrating 1600 or so hadith of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. MashaAllah, a lot of our youth present today how much time do you spend with the elders of community? People of your grandparents' age. And if we know, or if we are of that rank, or if we are considered as an elder, do we spend time with our youth, nurturing them, giving them time or company? This is an element of society. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made kids in his society feel comfortable with him. 
And even the youth of today needs to understand that there is some learning, that there is some experience to be gained when you spend time with your elders. People who are older than your parents' generation, you get to learn wisdom from them. You get to learn their, from their experiences. You know, subhanAllah, today we may not have access to that. You know, families are scattered apart. But this is a very integral part of a person's development that is missing from their lives. And they have to realize this fact as well. If your grandparents are not here, try to find people who can or who have, are of same age or who are older. Try to befriend them. Try to spend, even if it's an hour a week or an hour a month, go spend time with them and go do their khidmah. Go do their some service to them. And this brings me to story two, which is very important. Now, Abdullah ibn Abbas, what is he doing at this age of six, seven, eight years old? With the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. With the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is going somewhere, he jumps on the back of his right. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is walking, he's walking behind him. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is praying night prayer, he's trying his best to get there to pray with him. And then one day, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is praying his night prayer, this young boy sneaks in, and he's beside the Prophet ﷺ in his night prayer. And then he steps back. He steps back a few steps. Prophet ﷺ finishes his night prayer, turns around. He says, Oh Abdullah, why did you need, why did you have the need, or why did you feel the need to step back? He said, Oh Prophet of Allah, I realized your station and your maqam. I felt it was disrespectful for me to be standing beside you. So that feeling overtook me. As a result, I stepped back. He gave Prophet ﷺ respect. Key word here. He gave Prophet ﷺ respect. So Prophet ﷺ raised his hands. He said, Allahumma Atihi al hikmah O oh Allah, grant this boy wisdom. Hikmah. And Prophet said about hikmah, whoever is given hikmah, whoever is given wisdom, they have been given a good chunk of khair, khairan kathira, faqad utiya khairan kathira. That person has been given a huge chunk of goodness. Someone who has been granted wisdom. Now here, comes another story and inshallah after this story I will mention a few lessons combined from these stories so again Abdullah ibn Abbas now he's getting older he's getting older he's trying to serve Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam one night Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam performs the hajjud and then goes to sleep and he prepares water for his wudu and presents it to Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam how old is he right now? Around the age of seven, eight, or nine years. Seven, eight, or nine years, right? This young boy, realizing the virtue of Prophet ﷺ, realizing what he's after, what he's thinking, he presents water for the wudu of Prophet ﷺ. And at this point, Prophet ﷺ puts his hand on his shoulder and makes dua for him. He said, Allahumma faqihhu fi deen wa allimhu ta'wil. Oh Allah, grant him an understanding and comprehension in the deen, in religion, wa allimhu ta'wil, and give him the knowledge of interpreting the Quran al Kareem. Give him the knowledge to do commentary on the Quran al Kareem. So the lessons we can take from this. And these are really important lessons. And if you are young or elderly or both, 
you know, this is something which is really important. Try to get du'as of your teachers and not force du'a, but the du'a they make naturally. Right? We have this culture of approaching people or approaching our parents or approaching our teachers or approaching ulama or mashayikh. Tell them, please make du'a for me. Please make du'a for me. It is well and good, but try to get du'as which come out naturally. And this can happen with parents as well. Serve them in a way that from the bottom and the depth of their hearts, they make dua for you. Respect your teachers in a way that they are forced and they realize that you're special and they make dua for you. Because these are the duas that end up changing a person's fate. These are the duas that are a recipe for success in both worlds. Not du'as which are said or told or requested, but du'as that come out naturally from a person. You serve your parents, right? You do something good to them. You show them extreme kindness and love. And just in response, naturally, a du'a that comes out from them for you. These are the things a person needs to avail. Abdullah ibn Abbas, through his actions, he's earning the dua of Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and that dua is answered, and he's known as Tarjuman al-Quran, a person of authority to interpret the Quran. Also, if you are in a teaching for a profession, if you have students, make dua for your students. That is very important. Make dua for them. As I mentioned, you know, inshallah, moving on. He was at the age of 13 years old when the Prophet ﷺ left this world. And he narrated about 1600 hadith. And one of the hadith that he narrated, you know, I want to share just one hadith that just shows his level of maturity and his level of trust with the Prophet ﷺ the Prophet ﷺ was able to give him this advice. You know, if, especially if you have students and if you have children, you will look at their age, you will analyze their level of maturity or their level of intellect, and depending on that, you will give advice. Depending on that, you will give advice to their level. So this hadith is really important, which I'm just going to read to you. Imam al-Nawawi mentions this hadith in his collection of Adl al-Ba'oon as well. And this hadith, you know, subhanAllah, it strikes a person in all aspects of their lives. And this hadith is being said to Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhumah. Meaning, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam understood the level of intellect this boy possessed in order to say this advice or to tell him this advice that he will remember and narrate on. So what is the hadith? Ya ghulam, ala u'allimuka kalimatin yanfa'uka Allahu bihin. Faqultu bala, faqal ihfadillaha yahfadak, ihfadillaha tajidu amamak. تجده أمامك تعرف إلى الله في الرخاء يعرفك في الشدة وإذا سألت فاسأل الله وإذا استعنت فاستعن بالله قد جف القلم بما هو كائن فلو أن, خلق فلو أن الخلق كلهم, كلهم جميعا أرادوا أن ينفعوك بشيء لم يقضه الله لم يقدر عليه وإن أرادوا أن يضروك بشيء لم, يكتب لم يكتبه الله عليك لم يقدر عليه واعلم أن في الصبر على ما تكره خيرا كثيرا وأن النصر مع الصبر وأن الفرج مع الكرب وأن مع العسر يسرا أو غلام أو بوي Should I not tell you some words that will bring you benefit? Be mindful of Allah and you will find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protecting you every step of the way. Know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the times of ease, 
He will remember you at the times of difficulty. If you need to ask, only ask Allah. If you need help, seek help only from Allah. And remember the pens have dried. And also remember if the whole world and the whole creation would want to bring you any benefit which Allah has not written for you, they will not be able to sow. And if the whole world gathers to bring you harm which Allah has not written for you, they will not be able to do so. And remember, be patient on the things that you dislike, for there is a great khair, a great goodness in it. And remember, with patience is help. Victory is after adversity. And with every difficulty, there is ease. Look at the level of this advice. And look at the age of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma. This shows his level of maturity and his level of eagerness to learn from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Imam ibn Rajab al-Hanbali, he wrote a whole book, a treatise, just explaining this hadith of what was taught to this boy. How to live your life. Be mindful of Allah. If you need to ask, only ask for Allah. Don't only remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in hard times when things are difficult. Let that not be the only time you wake up for tahajjud. Let that not be the only time, you know, you increase your adhkar and everything. But even at the time of ease, at the time of goodness, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And things may not go smooth in your life. But remember what Allah has written for you, you will get that. People cannot bring you benefit, nor they can bring you harm. This is the level of advice Prophet ﷺ is telling Abdullah ibn Abbas So, inshallah, on to the next phase of his life. When Prophet ﷺ passes away, he is with one of his friends from the Ansar. He is from one of his friends from the Ansar. And he tells his friend, you know, today there are a lot of great Sahaba who are alive. Let us go to them and take knowledge from them and seek a hadith of Prophet ﷺ from them so that people can come to us and ask questions and we are able to answer. So people can come to us, ask questions and we are able to answer. Now, this boy, his friend, tells Abdullah ibn Abbas, people are going to come to you and ask you questions when there are people like great Sahaba present Sahabas like Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Zayd ibn Thabit, all these great Sahaba in their stature, they are present. Someone's going to come to you, 13 year old, ask you questions. So Abdullah ibn Abbas said, I parted my ways from him. I went on my journey. I went on my journey. To seek knowledge. He and he narrates this himself. He said, I would go from companion to companion seeking knowledge. And I would travel distances. Back in the day, they would have to travel distances to acquire knowledge. He said, Sometimes I would get to the doorstep of the companions, Sahaba who were older, at the time of Qaylula. Meaning at midday, when people would take naps, I would get to them at that time. So I did not want to disturb them. I would spread out my bath outside their doorstep and sit there until they would come out. And he said, it so happens sometimes that dust and the wind would blow. You know, subhanAllah. Whoever has spent time in the Middle East, 
they know of sandstorms. They know of sandstorms. And they know how hot it is at the time of Qaylula. When everyone cannot be bothered doing anything, they need to take a rest and nap. Right? At that time, he said, I would wait for them to come out. And I would not knock in order not to disturb them. These are the manners of seeking knowledge. You know, subhanAllah, he got to a maqam, he got to a level. How did he get to that level? Through doing this effort. We always talk about celebrities. We talk about sports uh, personalities. Right? They got to a level, but there is a whole process of, for them to getting to that level. We're talking about our Sahaba. Radiallahu anhumah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with them all. And you know, this is our turas. This is our heritage. This is our linkage. Today, dear brothers and sisters, a very crucial point of reflection. Ask people to write down a list of 10 of the most fam famous celebrities or sports people or sports persons and to write down a list of 10 Sahaba who were guaranteed Jannah. What do you think the result will be? So Abdullah ibn Mubarak uh, he was asked, don't you ever get bored? He said, how can I get bored? I live with Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I live with the Sahaba. You know, he came two generations or a generation after the Sahaba. What do you mean you live with them? He said, I have their words to contemplate. I'm always having their words in my mind. It is as if I'm living with them. So, going back to that story, taking knowledge. And then the Sahabi, who was the teacher, who Abdullah ibn Abbas came to take hadith or opinions from, he would come out and he would see the condition of the Abdullah ibn Abbas and he would say, Ya ibn Ammi Rasulillah, or the cousin of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa You know, why didn't you just knock? You are the cousin of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, it would have been an, uh, a place of honor had you just knocked. He said, I did not want to disturb you. I came here for the purpose of seeking knowledge, not to disturb. That's why I came here. And then he would ask questions. SubhanAllah. And then, Abdullah ibn Abbas also said that for one year, at the time of Umar radiallahu anhuma, I would circle him. Kana rajulan mahiban. He was a person of hayba. He was a person which people get, would get awestruck by. Right? There are some people who just have that, you know, ru'ab. Who just have that kind of uh, personality. So he said for one year, I tried to find an, a, a moment of opportunity in order to ask him one question about the tafsir of the Qur'an from Surah Tahrim. He said, for one whole year, I kept on looking for that perfect moment. So this is how we attain knowledge. Now, <coughs> sorry. at the time of Umar radiallahu anhu, at the time of Umar radiallahu anhu, it is almost towards the middle of his khala khilafa. He has he has a concept of shura consultation with the group of sahaba, usually the kibar of the sahaba, the elders of the sahaba. He would request the presence of Abdullah ibn Abbas. He would request the presence of Abdullah ibn Abbas in that majlis, in that gathering. Now some Sahaba naturally were taken back. You know, what, what is this young boy doing in this gathering? So Umar radiallahu anhu replied, ذَاكُمُ fata al-kahul." This boy, he's very mature. 
ذاكم الفتاة كهول ولسانه سؤول he has a tongue which asks the right questions inquires the right way وقلبه عقول a heart that is very uh, that is full of wisdom and full of intellect and then he at the time of Umar رضي الله عنه he appoints he appointed the Khalifa of Muslimin, Abdullah ibn Abbas, as one of his advisors on the matters of Quran. On the matters of Quran. Inshallah, next week we'll go into some of the details of how Abdullah ibn Abbas differed from other Sahaba when it came to giving the meaning of the Quran. So, this young fellow, his friend, Going back to that story, from whom he parted ways. Who? Abdullah ibn Abbas. Remember he parted ways with that person who said, who is going to ask you? Now, at the mid-range of Umar radiallahu anhu's khilafah, how old do you think Abdullah ibn Abbas was? Let's see how, how much history we know. Very good, 2021. So the two years of Umar radiallahu anhu, 15. And then five, six years. Umar radiallahu anhu ruled for 10 years. Uthman radiallahu anhu ruled for 12 years. So that person, seeing Abdullah ibn Abbas as an advisor to Umar radiallahu anhu and giving out answers to the people's questions, looking at that manzar, Looking at that scene, looking at that sight, he said, minni. He was much more smarter than I was. He was much more smarter than I was. So what did he say at the beginning? Let's go out and seek hadith. Let's go out and seek knowledge so people can come to us and ask us questions. You know what you call this? You call this foresight. You call this farasa. You call this vision of a person who sees far ahead that you know sahabas, these, young, these older sahaba, they won't be present. You know someone would need to step into their shoes. Let's get a jump ahead on that. Let's get on it. This is called foresight, not fortnight. fortnight. <laughs> foresight, which a 13 year old boy had. So develop this foresight. Also leadership, talking about the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. Right? Leadership. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa greatest leader in humanity. Develop leaders. Right? Who is a leader? Who has an impact? These Sahaba went across the earth. At, in which year did, we, did Muslims enter Spain? Which year Hijri? Or 92. 92. So 92 year Hijri, Muslims enter, entered Spain all the way to the west. Right? The last Sahabi to pass away was in uh, year 100 after Hijri. Abu Tufail, Amir ibn Wathila. Right? These were the next generation of Tabi'een who went across the earth. Almost the entirety of the earth took Islam there, spread the whole Islam. This is what leadership is, right? When we have such a huge source of inspiration in our heritage, in our books, why don't we take benefit from that? Why don't we learn that? Why don't we talk about that? You know, inshallah, I will conclude my lesson here with that thought. Inshallah, next class, I will go into of how Abdullah ibn Abbas, when he got to the authority of narrating Quran. So I've gone through his journey of his early life. Now, I will talk, inshallah, next class, we'll talk about, you know, when he was giving out the interpretations of the Quran and how he basically pioneered that field of tafsir, which everyone takes benefit from up to today and then inshallah also next week we'll go into the 
life of another Sahabi and how he impacted the field of Hadith. Jazakumullah khayran. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.